I want to talk about research software and technical maturity. But first, let's have a look back. Earlier this year, we, that is the EURIS network, the European Research Infrastructure Software Engineers Network, we consist of SESTA, Clarin, Daria and Operas, four infrastructures in the domains of social sciences and humanities offering services for researchers. We were planning a workshop on software quality through automation and testing. It was supposed to take place in, an, in Utrecht on the 26th of March, but as you can guess from that date, it did not quite turn out that well. Um, things happened. In fact, everything became digital. The entire world, overnight, went into home office. Zoom conferences became the thing. Although there were some problems. I mean, have you tried ordering a laptop or webcam to equip your home office this year? Other surprising dependencies on fax machines to transmit test data from facilities and laboratories to authorities. And this is not just a problem in the US. I know that Germany had very similar problems for a very long time. Reliance on very outdated technology. So what does any of that have to do with research software engineering? Well, there was one case of scalability that you may have heard about, and it concerns pandemic modeling. Neil Ferguson tweeted about it, about his code that he'd written many years ago in C, not very well documented, and that was now used to influence the UK government's response to the coronavirus. Now, following this tweet, a lot of discussion happened. Many people were throwing arguments on many different sides. Questions were raised on why this software is not up to industry standards. What about peer review was the answer to this. Quality assurance through technical measures, through manual measures, model verification versus testing and documentation, extensive manual verification of the work that is done as the answer from the academic side. There was also the question of why this software is not available open source. It's been publicly funded. But actually, I don't want to talk about this particular problem. In fact, it's not really a new problem. I mean, the question that academic recognition is only given for the application and not for the code, that it's only about the model and not the implementation of it. This is a topic we've been discussing for many years at RSE conferences and things are changing, although we still have problems. So let's talk about the more specific problem. Let's talk about scalability. Well, did you ever get your webcam? By the way, what happened to all these cruise ships? I mean, they must have gone somewhere. Did you know that the Wikipedia article on Zoom bombing was created on the 28th of March this year? Apparently that wasn't a thing before then. Works on my machine is one of the most common problems of scalability, where things work on the developer's machine, but not on anybody else's. You may have read this quote before by Donald Knut, the author of The Art of Computer Programming and also the inventor of Tech. Beware of the bugs in the above code. I've only proved it correct, not tried it. It's generally taken as a joke, but Sometimes I fear people do actually live by it. So what can we do about it? Well, there do exist good practices. Starting with documentation, then looking at the build pipeline, then looking into tests, and finally starting with code, and I literally mean it in that order. Start by documenting what you're embarking on, then working onto the build, looking onto the testing, looking onto the coding comes down to scaling and weighting these issues and prioritizing in the right way. Although you're probably thinking that's not realistic and unfortunately yes it's not that simple as just doing this. Right? I mean computer science and software engineering are not the same. The degree in one does not mean you are proficient in the other. Learning by doing on your own also doesn't always work. I will use the opportunity for a quick shout out to some designated training opportunities. 
the software carpentries and cold refinery do offer training on this and they can explain much better on what you should do and how to do it than me. So let's rather talk about what we do at SESTA and at our infrastructure consortium, the URIS network. Well, research software is generally thought of as a spectrum. You have the domain researcher on the one side, you have the software engineering on the other side, and somewhere in between there's research software engineering, which brings the two sides together. We as infrastructures generally do think of ourselves as being more on the software engineering side, but still we're offering services target to the researchers, possibly developed by researchers. We also think of it as bridging gaps. We do have the researchers and the experts on the one side with their code, with their software projects, and on the other side we have the data centers, the libraries, the infrastructure providers, maybe even commercial cloud providers. And usually, or very often at least, when trying to communicate directly, there can be some barriers in between. And this is where we try to come in with sort of a black box, and like any other black box, it's of course red, that has some big cockwheels inside with a bit of oil and grease, and throw on top some magic and rocket science if you want. And this is kind of what we're trying to build, making it possible to connect these two worlds. So, what's that got to do with anything? Well, research software solves research questions. But infrastructure is more about providing reliable services. And these are not separate issues. Because for us, as research infrastructures, we want to provide a reliable service that can be used to solve your research question. So we are concerned with technical maturity. There exists a model that's called technology readiness levels. It was originally developed by NASA. Um, it's a scale from one through nine, where nine means your technology is ready to put an astronaut on it and send them to space and hope that they will come back. The European Commission has adopted this model for their funding program Horizon 2020 and it's also now forming the basis for the European Open Science Cloud, a collaboration of infrastructures like us and also other domains and also more generic infrastructures and even commercial providers offering research services for Europe. Now, Let's have a closer look at what the EC writes on these technology readiness levels, and in particular at level 4, it's about technology validated in a lab environment. Well, I personally think this is anything all you can imagine or you can expect for any research software to fulfill if it's just about getting a paper out. Some people even say it's probably more on the 2 to 3 level that you would expect, but let's go for 4, that's a good step. Although level 7, prototype demonstration in an operational environment, well, that's still only beta. So there is a long step from the thing you do to write a paper to having something that's viable as a beta service. Production, in the definition of the European Open Science Cloud, starts at technology written in level 8 with 9 being the optimum. Although, as I've said, you can't expect everything to be technology rated as level 9. Research software is often experimental, just as research itself, and that's for very good reasons. You wouldn't send an astronaut to space using a PhD candidate's prototype rocket. You wouldn't invest in technology without more than a single laboratory using it. Let's have another look at Horizon 2020 and its deliverable types. You have the obvious one like documents and reports, you have demonstrators, you have other things like websites and press filings and so on, and then you have the other category, and that includes software. So software is something that is other in the terms of the European Commission when it comes to output of European funding for projects, for research. 
And by the way, whenever you try to submit one of those deliverables, the generic question you're getting is, where's the PDF? So at SESTA, we're trying to do it a bit differently. And let me just mention what we do at SESTA. We do offer social science study data. We have a central data catalog, and you can access the data at our national institutions. On top of that, we have a European language social science thesaurus. We have a number of controlled vocabularies. Those two are targeted at our research data holding institutions. They offer them possibilities to classify the data in a controlled way, in a multilingual way that can be translated into other languages in an automatic fashion. We will soon have a question bank. Uh, we also have a very good data management expert guide on our website, and we do offer a lot of training. You can find out more on our website. Um, I want to talk more about the technical services that we offer, and that for us is more than just the software. It includes documentation, and I would say the documentation is part of the service that we offer. It includes user support, it includes terms of use, for the end user, what you can use your services for. And of course it's a question of sustainability and reliability. You as a researcher want to know that our services will be available a few years into the future. If you're relying on them now, you want to be sure you can rely on them for the duration of your project. But these services are ultimately powered by technology, by software products, as we call them. And these are usually internally developed solutions targeted directly to our specific needs. In some cases, it can also be standard software that we just use as is. We run them on our reliable cloud infrastructure that we're running on Google Cloud. We're building it with Kubernetes, Docker, Jenkins, SonarCube, Java, Python, all the good and hot stuff. And we do this through our SESTA projects. This is work that we award to our national institutions to carry out work on behalf of the infrastructure. These projects include deliverables and reporting just like any European Commission project or any other grant funding. And for this, we have now introduced something that we call a deliverable of type software release. And our definition is that. It's the link to a Git release tag inside a Git repository that includes the updated changelog for the version referencing the relevant issues in the repositories. Now, obviously, we're tracking all our version control in Git. And what we do is we keep the changelog where we include what's been changing over time. And then when we release something, we have to make sure that we do update that changelog. And then it's just a matter of tagging the particular commit that corresponds to the release with the version number in Git. And that Git tag is ultimately what we call the deliverable. Such a release does require manual Q&A. We do have automation that supports it, but part of it is manual. And by the way, this is also the thing you would publish to Zenodo. And this is what we do in the case of our open source product developments. So what do our QA requirements look like? Well, we have something that we call the software maturity levels. It's a model we've been developing for multiple years now, and it's a manual process of assessing a given software's maturity along a number of criteria with different levels, and you can read up the details on Zenodo. We also want a code coverage of 80%, and we want less than 3% lines of code duplication. Um, we also want what we call the AAA rating, the maintainability, reliability, and security rating of A. That's something defined by SonarCube, but you can look up what it means. And then there's the question of user engagement, because as I said, it's services powered by products, but the service is more than that. So we do have a user representative who engages with the development leader and who makes sure that we actually know what we're developing and which version that will be implemented. The functionality must meet these requirements and this is what they will test. But the quality check comes first, partially through automation, 
If you don't pass these gates, it can't be released. We do also run internal trainings on this. So let's have a look back at these good practices I mentioned earlier. Documentation, building, testing, coding. As I said, we have manual QA on the release. We have tooling. We always make sure that our documentation is up to date, that it matches the new functionality and that we can release it just in time. We also have a number of continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines that allow us to automatically build on every single commit. We run unit and integration tests and they will fail the builds if it's broken. We also have coding styles and guidelines and we do run static analysis of all the code. These guidelines, by the way, are also developed in the context of the URIs network, so this is not just SESTA's guidelines, it's also something that we agree on with Opera's Daria and Clarin. So, have we now solved everything? Well, first and foremost, you're probably gonna say, wait, hold on. My software is not that crucial and doesn't have to be as robust as those rockets sending astronauts to space. People's lives don't depend on my model. And, well, maybe you're right. Maybe they don't. But just for one moment, imagine a situation where you're being asked a question or statement similar to Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. And what can you really say to your favorite Disney princess other than, sure, I'll do my best. So what, what can we do to be ready for such a situation? Well. We have to look at quality and we have to invest in quality. Wisely, that is. As I said, not everything has to be technology readiness level 9, but we should make sure that everything gets as good as it can and should. Everything does have a certain value and too often that's not clear in advance. You don't know what your software will be used for a few years down the line. And of course, and this is something we've now done internally and we hope others will do, incentives and rewards are needed that enforce proper requirements on all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so that was perfectly time, of course, for this talk. Uh, let's see if we get any questions in the chat. In any case, I, I would have one and maybe I just uh, can start asking you. Uh, so, I mean, I, I really like, like great talk and I love the emphasis that you made at the end, like quality is really crucial. And that's also one of the discussion we have um, in the, yeah, in this related discussion around FAIR and software and what does it mean and what kinds of quality can maybe FAIR cover. Um, and uh, yeah, but that, that's a big context. So I agree we need to talk about that. And then you said in one of the slides towards the end as well, so in the code code review and static analysis. And I was wondering like, what, it, what are the things in static analysis you're already doing? And are there maybe things um, in, in that broad area that would be beneficial and interesting to do, but for some reasons that are not done yet? Maybe there's a very, very specific question, but <laughs> or just uh, see, yeah, try to hear what you, you have to say about that. Um, so we using SonarCube um, to run the static analysis of our code. Uh, we have mostly Java code. I mentioned there's also a bit of Python. We do have some other things lying around, but it's mostly Java for the main application. So in that regard, um, SonarCube does a very good job. There's other solutions like uh, code well, code, code climate um, mm. that's also available for open source projects for free uh, integrates nicely with github as well um, we run our infrastructure ourselves uh, trying to be a bit more independent um, but 
ultimately both are, are options if, if you're looking to find something for yourself. There's also discussions going on. I mentioned this European Open Science Cloud. There is a project looking into providing a Jenkins environment for researcher to run their tools in uh, and to make use of such kind of tests that you can use. Um, that is supposed to come to a conclusion within the next two years and as I said, build some sort of pipeline that then integrates uh, all these possibilities for researchers to use. Okay. There's a question now in the chat. So Matthew is asking, um, I'm a bit unclear on what service you are actually offering and to who. Are you targeting researchers with your services to help them produce higher technology readiness level products, research software, or was it? Um, no, so the services we offer are on the data that we have in our archives, the study data for social sciences. Um, but in order to do so, we need reliable software. And this is why we're um, very much engaged in this discussion of how can we ensure that the, quality, the software we produce is of high enough quality so that we can ultimately make these assurances, that we can make the promise that you will have the data in a year, in five years, um, that you can rerun them. Uh, and there's other levels of uh, services that we're looking into that you can also use the so services to then process the data, not just access it. Uh, in particular, in cases where you can't easily access the data, where there's restrictions for legal reasons, protection, et cetera, um, where you may be able to execute remotely some sort of analysis and then only get the results back. Um, and in particular, in these situations, we come into a question if a archive is going to run your analysis program on their systems, they want to be sure that whatever they're executing is safe to execute. Now, there's lots of problems involved with that. I mean, your problem co program could just copy all the data. So there's things that need to be verified that you have to do manually. But at the same time, as I said, we're interested in making sure our services are reliable. Um, and we're trying to make as much of what we learn publicly available. So the links to our public documentation are available where we explain all of that. And this is also why we're engaging with the um, code refinery in particular that I mentioned earlier on providing this training. Because our experience is that our archives hire people out of academia that have some sort of computer science uh, education usually. Sometimes they come directly from social sciences with uh, the added knowledge of computer science. But as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean they are familiar with all the technologies that we're using. Uh, adopting very much from industry and uh, we're, we're teaching them also how to learn it. And also this material we are working towards making it available. The material we did, for instance, last year is available from our website, though it's probably not that prominently linked. Okay. 